Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Vandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. It's all about total Bitcoin, total decentralization. And um, I've got a very, very special guest. It's Jan Pritzker, author of Inventing Bitcoin. Jan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for coming to the show. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, and uh, I'll ask you my questions, specific questions, about <laughs> a little bit later. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Kevin. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, I apologize a little bit for my voice as I've just been getting over a cold. Uh, so my, uh, a little bit about myself, I've been doing technology for the last 20 years. I got into computers when I was a kid, started coding when I was, you know, maybe seven or eight years old and uh, uh, got into more serious stuff in, um, in junior high and high school. And then went to school for computer science and linguistics and uh, thought I was gonna do AI stuff. Uh, but eventually got into startups and got just really excited about startups and worked basically from uh, the early 2000s through uh, a couple of years ago uh, on various startups from a technology standpoint. Um, I was an early engineer, a co-founder, uh, you know, just kind of specializing in early stage startups. And, and that, you know, what I really like about that is, is that you get to wear a lot of different hats. You're not just necessarily coding. You're also thinking about business strategy and design and uh, product and all that kind of stuff. So uh that's kind of what i've done for the last uh, 20 years uh in around uh so uh, the other thing is i i come from a uh a country that has experienced socialism which is a former soviet union i'm actually from from ukraine and my parents and i and my sister immigrated in 1989 to the states so um those two things kind of my technology background and my background with uh with money and seeing sort of the abuses of of governments on money really brought me to bitcoin uh through a very convoluted path so um the way i got into bitcoin is uh i actually heard about it in 2011 which uh, you know from slash that i read some article about how some people were trying to create this uh, you know new payment system i didn't really understand what it was i didn't really dig too deeply into it but I thought, okay, it's some kind of experimental new thing. And I, I ended up buying some Bitcoin around $30. <laughs> and um, because I never really bothered to look at what it was, uh, I, then bought, I basically bought the top of that bubble in, in 20, when I, what, 2011, I think. And I saw the value of it go down from $30 to $2 and basically said, okay, this is a joke. Um, I, I either sold my, my Bitcoin at the bottom at the $2 or I lost the keys. I don't remember exactly what happened. Uh, but I definitely remember the the number two dollars and thinking it was over and so i completely forgot about it and then in 2013 i heard about it again and uh again i looked at sort of the ecosystem i saw that there was a coinbase uh, app and it looked pretty nice it looked like somebody was actually putting in the effort to work on on bitcoin so i said okay maybe this is actually a thing i bought it at a thousand dollars and again it went down to something like 300 200 dollars and i was like okay I, I have no idea what this is but i'm just gonna you know focus on my startups and again, never bothered to really research it or understand it. Uh, so it wasn't really until 2016 that I decided to, uh, to start paying attention. And it was actually through a very strange channel because my cousin who was working for Microsoft strategy, uh, their blockchain strategy came to me and he was like, um, you should look at Ethereum. There's some really interesting stuff going on in Ethereum. And I looked at Ethereum and being that I'm a developer, I, I saw their you know, marketing around like you can build a bank and 100 lines of code. And it was really impressive uh, from the marketing standpoint, like the, the value proposition that they try to sell to developers is really impressive. I started asking uh, other developers who I worked with, you know, what they thought of it. And everybody was like pretty interested in, in what the idea was. So I started digging into it and I probably spent the first six months of like my, you know, around 2016, um, understanding Ethereum and then started to realize, hey, this is like Bitcoin. And I remember something about Bitcoin. So I started researching Bitcoin and got super deep into it and just fell down the rabbit hole. Um, and I think over the next year, uh, watching every video I could get my hands on by Andreas Antonopoulos and uh, listening to every podcast I get my hands on, I listened to uh, Stefan Levera and I listened to, you know, guys like that and, and started like really coming back to the idea of what Bitcoin was. And then I was just completely, um, I was just completely sold. I was just so interested in this idea that we could have a, a true, true, um, freedom money that was, 
not something that the government could take away from us. Uh, it was really powerful for me with my background. So that's why I decided to focus uh, on Bitcoin exclusively and um, left my job. I was the CTO at Reverb, uh, which was a startup that we founded in 2012. Uh, and we built that company from just me and, and the other founder, David, to about 150 people. Uh, I was doing about $500 million in sales. And it was a very successful company, but I decided that Bitcoin was something that I really needed to give my full attention to. Mm. Um, and so in 27, 2018, early 2018, I left uh, Reverb to focus exclusively on Bitcoin, even though I'd been writing about Bitcoin for a while and, and things like that. And so, yeah, decided to write a book because that was the best way to, to teach myself and to teach others is to explain something. Uh, so I decided to, to write a book and that's, that's how I've gotten to where I am today. Wow. You know, I, I always find this very fascinating uh, hearing and listening to the stories, the path of, you know, how people like you, you know, go, coming from a specialized, you know, with a specialized knowledge or technical background or whatever that is, you know, going down the rabbit hole and then totally dedicating one's time to Bitcoin. I find this so, you know, it's not only, you know, it's very fascinating, but I find it, um, let's just put it this way. Um, I, there's a, there's an ethical sense in it. I, you know, there's so many people out there that like, um, you know, we all went through that rabbit hole or we went, you know, through trial and error, you know, shit coinery, all coinery, you know, all this blockchain bullshit. I mean, I don't want to call it bullshit, but you know, you know what I'm saying, right. but, right. um, so, um, so, you know, and that is your book is, is another, you know, great contribution to, um, expanding, let's just say, you know, the average people's, um, understanding comprehension mm -hmm. and that is what is so so you know immensely important and urgent and necessary in these times because people get like so overwhelmed and overloaded not only you know with technical terminology but even if they wanted to get like a handful of satoshis i totally you know feel empathy with you know people around mm -hmm. me i mean i'm already overwhelmed with all this whatever coin join and privacy mm -hmm. you know i mean I'm, I'm already very experienced but mm -hmm. like sharing this knowledge and and the essence of the question why bitcoin what does it mm -hmm. mean what does it mean for us you know for as uh, for us you know as an individual as a collective as a as a human civilization and i think people just don't get it it's hard because there's not a single aspect that is not covered by bitcoin so what's your take on that like your approach to you know i to be honest with you shamefully i haven't read your book in total i just read a few a few pages i haven't had the time but i just loved it the way you approach it you know very yeah, sure pedagogically and very empathically thank you yeah i appreciate that and i appreciate your your kind words there and uh, yeah there's a lot of people who are partially through the book it's funny because it's a short book but it actually takes a while to digest in my opinion um and the reason so what what is the book about i'm trying to explain bitcoin from a relatively technical perspective from the side of like how does how does it actually work right and the reason i'm trying to do that is because there's a lot of claims that are made about Bitcoin, such as uh, it's decentralized or there's a 21 million um, limit to the number of coins and so on and so forth. But the thing is, those claims feel empty unless you can really back up why, why they hold, right? Uh, and for me, when I first heard about Bitcoin, and I thought, okay, this is interesting. Like, it's interesting to have this kind of you know, fixed supply money. Nobody can take it from you. But, but why is that the case? How does that actually, how can we say that that's the case? And I don't think you can really arrive there unless you really understand the technology. Um, and to me, there's a ton of really good uh, economic thought on Bitcoin out there. Uh, like I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts, with people really, really good at describing why Bitcoin works from an economic standpoint. And, and I've learned a ton there because I'm not really, uh, I wasn't very economically literate, I think, when it came um, uh, before I got into Bitcoin. I was very technically literate. But I came in uh, from the technology side and started looking at it. And I started understanding why the claims around decentralization are valid. Why, how do we enforce, you know, these rules in the network and that kind of thing. Um, and that's when I really, it really clicked for me. And I realized that Bitcoin really was um, something that could become this sort of truly censorship resistant money that, that, you know, if you have a disaster like a Venezuela, like the Soviet Union, um, a place that won't allow you to own any foreign currency, uh, any stable currency, you're forced to use this kind of, totally depreciated um, currency of, of the government. Like this is what Bitcoin is for, right? It's a sort of safe haven that allows uh, and prevents these, these totally preventable disasters, right? These are 
like the Soviet Union, Venezuela, these were 100% preventable disasters. These are things that the government created these problems. They created the problems because they tried to get too heavy handed with how the economy ran. Uh, and people were then forced essentially at gunpoint into participating in the system. And this is something where, you know, when I got into Bitcoin, I started listening to Andreas and uh, I really resonated with the video uh, called Currency Wars, where he talked about how all over the world governments are working at eradicating cash. Uh, and you can see this happening, you know, and it's happening not necessarily like, I think he, he thinks it's more like, uh, like the governments are being malicious. And in some cases they are. But in a lot of cases, it's happening out of convenience, right? Like people are going to digital payments in the United States, not because anybody's forcing them to. It's just because like we have credit cards, we have Apple Pay, uh, we have Facebook trying to get into the game. People are moving to electronic forms of payments regardless, right? It's, it's a convenience thing. Uh, and in certain cases, uh, if the government wants to abuse that, they now have a much better lever because they have this centralized payment system that they can just get into monitor every transaction, censor transactions, and so on. Um, and also do implement like really crazy stuff like negative interest rate policy, you know, through like you keep your money in your bank account and you know, the, the money just kind of evaporates over time if you don't use it. There's been papers put out about how to do this kind of stuff and it's really, really crazy, right? But if, if you don't have cash, if you don't have peer-to-peer -peer payment uh, mechanism where you know, you have this thing in your hand and it's worth something and you can hand it to somebody, and you can create a transaction without anybody else being in the middle of that, then you're giving up a ton of, of freedom. And it just encourages these, you know, these Soviet Union, Venezuela kind of scenarios to, to occur. And uh, I don't think we want that. I don't think anybody who's lived through that would want to see that happen again. And that, that's what motivates me and why I, I sort of went through um, the, the, the topic of how to, how to actually implement, you know, how, how does Bitcoin work so that you can understand it and say, okay, yes, these claims are valid. This really is something, uh, this is a money you can carry in your head. This is a money that can't be taken from you. This is a money that can't be inflated by the government. Um, and that becomes a, a huge you know, selling point if, to people once they really understand how it works. And that's the art, right? The challenge, like to pick up the people where they are at the level of knowledge, because, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very humble. I mean, I, I didn't know shit about, you know, Austrian <laughs> economics, you know, principle. Right. I, 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 until I read, you know, the Bitcoin stand by Safed and Amuse and, you know, but like pick them up, like, okay, people have a sense, they, they have a notion, they have an understanding what gold is. It's relative scarce. I mean, if you, if, you know, I, I guess you, you know, mm -hmm. right. So my question to you is, what, what do you think is the, the conditioned thinking or the, you know, the, the, the flaws and errors in people's b minds when it comes to explaining like the essence of Bitcoin? Like why, why, why is it so transformational, so evolutionary? I mean, I call it always the monetary root layering because the monetary root layer, layering means for me, uh, you know, all this, the, the whole system we have, you know, with the um, with the central banks, with the privately owned central banks in collusion with the governments and this whole centralized structures, we don't need to fight them. You know, we don't have time for occupy this and occupy that and revolutions. It's really time for creating a new structure. And that is uh, what I'm always trying to, you know, explain to people, like, you know, you know what that means? Like, uh, like in 10, 20, 30 years, I see a totally different civilizational process as Hoppe, you know, Austrian economists, I think called it the process of civilization mm -hmm. because it could go in any direction, you know, scientifically, technologically, structurally, socially, even spiritually, you know? So um, what do you see? What, do you, what are you observing when you're like, you know, talking to people around you in your environment? What, is, what are the obstacles in, you know, in comprehending this? Mm -hmm. Whole yeah, so I so I have actually given a few talks at high schools. Um, I have a few teach, uh, friends who are teachers at high schools, and a lot of their students are interested in Bitcoin. They've heard about it. Um, a lot of them are coming at it from like, "Oh, I heard you can make money on this, right? Like, how do I make money?" Um, which is understandable because if you're in America, a lot of the um, the need for Bitcoin isn't obvious, right? If you if you ask an American, uh, average American, like they don't understand necessarily how the monetary system works to begin with, and the truth is our money basically works, okay? Regardless of all the yeah. sort of Bitcoiner, hardcore Bitcoiner thought on how the USD is going to zero, like generally speaking, the average person, when they go to the grocery store and they pay money, they get goods and the goods are abundant and there's no problem. 
And yes, there's inflation, but the inflation is relatively minor and people, well, you know, we're not going to get into you know, the subtleties of inflation necessarily just now. But, but when people talk about, like I was having this conversation with my dad about inflation, he's like, there's no inflation. And I said, yeah, you know, yeah, sure. Like there's a little bit of inflation in products, but like, look at the cost of healthcare, look at the cost of education, look at the cost of you know, housing, like look at the stock market. There's no inflation really. <laughs> um, but so the thing is the average American, when, they, when they're spending money, they're, really, they're not thinking about that stuff, right? Um, so first of all, our inflation isn't bad. Second of all, our, uh, our censorship of money isn't bad. Like I'm not really worried that like the government's watching my every transaction, like when I go to the grocery store and use my Visa card or something like that. Maybe they are, I don't know. Uh, but I'm not worried that they're going to prosecute me for going to protest. Like we have a pretty good uh, sort of libertarian oriented system here in America, regardless of, you know, various uh, directions that uh, towards authoritarianism it might be taking. Uh, by and large, we, we don't have a problem with that stuff. So if, for Americans to understand Bitcoin, it's actually pretty difficult. Now, I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of uh, immigrants, just like myself, a lot of Russian immigrants, um, a, lot, a lot of former Soviet immigrants. And I think for them, it's a little bit easier to understand because I can tell them the story. Like I asked my parents when we left, I was, I was too young. I was about seven years old when we left. So I asked them what happened with our money when we left the Soviet Union. And they said, well, uh, the government allowed us to exchange a hundred us dollars worth of currency per person. That's what we were allowed to keep uh, at the government's exchange rate. Right. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. We were not allowed to own foreign currency. So we had no way of sort of storing our wealth and, and the, the street exchange rate for the, the ruble was, was garbage, right? Like our money was worthless. So they gave us a hundred bucks worth and that's what we left the country with. So we came to America, you know, $400 in our pocket and, and some kind of uh, a few goods that we, were, we took with us to sell. Like that's crazy. <laughs> and it's, it's very, um, it's much easier to explain to uh, a Soviet immigrant that, uh, that Bitcoin is a necessity because you can say, okay, look, this is something that if you had it, you would have been able to leave the country with your wealth intact, or you would have at least been able to, you know, store, store some wealth in this kind of unseizable, uninflatable asset. So I think it's a challenge explaining it to Americans. Um, I, one thing I'd like to do is, especially when I'm talking to kids, as I use this example of like a candy bar and I show them a, a, like a 1950s candy bar and the price is like five cents. And then I say, look, that same candy bar today costs like one to two dollars. They get it. So, huh? Yeah. And they're like, oh, really? <laughs> What's going on there? Um, is candy, why is candy getting more expensive? And uh, the answer is the candy hasn't gotten more expensive. It's the dollar that's gotten less powerful in its purchasing uh, ability, right? Yeah. Um, and then you kind of go, I go from that to saying, okay, well, look, this is in America where we generally are pretty responsible with our money. And we also have a very interesting sort of privileged uh, position in the world where our money is the world reserve currency effectively. Uh, so we kind of have to be responsible with it to some degree, but look at, you know, Venezuela, look at Argentina, look at Turkey, look at Iran, look at all these other places yeah. that are having inflation problems. Yeah. That I mean, candy I'm a, bar, I'm a, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry to you interrupt know. you. I'm, I'm yeah, originally from, from Iran because you said you were mm -hmm. seven years old. It's so funny. I was seven years old too when I left Iran, okay. you know, during the revolution and stuff. Sure, sure. And now we have inflation. I think it's around like 37, 40% or something. Yeah. It's like, yeah. right. Yeah. So that, that literally like double your candy bar in a few years, right? Yeah. So it's much easier to see that. And then I show them like, uh, Zimbabweans uh, with the wheelbarrows of cash, a classical kind of uh, issues there. And, and you know, uh, the pictures of people coming back from Venezuela with a suitcase full of boulevards that are worth like $5. I mean, that sort of starts to drive over the problems that we have in our, in our modern system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And people are mining like crazy in Iran. <laughs> now they got the mosques. Yeah, I heard that about the tool like, because of whatever the, the electric now we're getting problems because yeah, until now the electricity has been subsidized, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean super cheap electricity. Of course, you know we got super cheap energy, and right. well, of course people and, and I think uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that statistically uh, the the population um, segmentation is like. I don't know, 70% of uh, Iran's population is below 30 years. It's like a pretty oh, wow. young generation. Okay. So I think this is my hope that 
you know, I mean, I don't care about the regime and, you know, all this, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of this. <laughs> so, so, but I do care, you know, about the people of Iran, that the people <coughs> of Iran finally, you know, empower themselves. And maybe, you know, who knows, maybe Iran is going to be the first country who's going to mass adopt or trigger the mass adoption of Bitcoin. You know, that's mm -hmm. like my, my ultimate dream that it, that we have like a super global mass adoption by, I know it's super childish, but by 2024 or 2028, like, like a few billion people. Do you think it's realistic? Yeah. Well, I, I, th I actually kind of agree with you in how it might happen. So I, I see kind of a few forces happening here. One is you have the countries with the biggest financial problems also have the biggest, uh, typically the biggest authoritarian problems as well, right? And you have this new generation of people, young people coming up in a different world. They're, they're seeing Bitcoin as a possibility. I mean, we have stories of people in Venezuela mining Bitcoin and then using it to buy food to neighboring countries and then smuggling the food in, right? So we're seeing this, like these small cycles establishing, we're seeing the people mining Bitcoin inside of the Iranian mosque, right? So to me, I, I always had this dream. I don't think it's going to happen, but my dream was very similar to yours where like the Bitcoin miners within these countries, they basically start to amass the only actual money that matters, right? Like if the Iranian real and if the Venezuelan Bolivar are, are done for, then eventually the people with the Bitcoin are the ones with the money. And if they're the ones with the money, technically they're the ones with the armies. And if they're the ones with the armies, then they're the ones, you know, taking over the government effectively, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I mean, if you want to look at it kind of at a, at a very uh, radical uh, level, that could theoretically happen, right? If, if, if Bitcoin continues to gain in value and these currencies continue to depreciate, then you are left with the first uh, people who are smart enough to start mining Bitcoin as the ones in power, which is really, really crazy. Um, could it happen within 10 years? I, I'm probably more skeptical about that than most people. Uh, and here's the reason. I think that there's two, there's two things that prevent that from happening in my book. One is, so if you look at like that, I'm sure you've seen the plan B uh, stock to flow model that uh -huh. says we're going to be at, you know, 10 million in, uh, in 10 years or whatever. If that were to happen, um, that implies a, a gigantic portion of the world's wealth pouring into Bitcoin within 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the first question you have to ask is how does that actually happen? Okay. If, if it happens through exchanges and stuff like that, we have a big, a lot of uh, central points of failure and governments will start to try to shut those uh, things down, especially in authoritarian uh, countries like, uh, you know, North Korea and Iran and uh, Venezuela and stuff like that. Right. Um, the second thing to me is you have, and also not, not only are, are people trying to onboard that way, but also the, the chain capacity is a problem too. Like onboarding that many people, uh, into Bitcoin on chain is going to be difficult. Uh, maybe it happens through Lightning Network. There's a lot of unresolved questions there uh, from the user experience perspective. Secondly, I believe uh, that Bitcoin requires a culture shift. And I think this is something that Jack uh, uh, Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, touched upon as well. Um, he said something to the effect of like kids now they're born with iPads and when they see a screen that doesn't respond to touch, they think it's broken. It's like not of correct implementation right uh to me it's the same with bitcoin you know when a kid grows up with bitcoin and you say okay uh you've been using bitcoin all your life now you're old enough to open up a bank account uh you have to do all this stuff show them your id you have to wait three to five days to like transfer money to a different country like uh maybe even longer uh sometimes it's closed like there's you know if you're in a country that that has a, a broken financial system maybe you don't even have banks so you try to explain that stuff to a kid that grew up with Bitcoin as the normal, and then the bank is the weird one, right? Like it, it shifts the perspective. So I think, I, I don't think that we, the, you know, I'm 37 right now. So I don't think we are the generation that adapts Bitcoin. I think we're the generation that explains Bitcoin to our children. Mm -hmm. And then our children are growing up with the stories, you know, like the people in Venezuela, it's too late for them. They, they really don't have the money at this point to sort of escape the, the, the problem. The ones that did have, but the, by and large, they're living in poverty. So the people who are, who escaped, you know, Venezuela to some degree are now telling their kids like, Hey, this happened to our country. This is what we did. We bought Bitcoin. We had this thing that we were able to escape with. And here's some Bitcoin for you. You can inherit it or, you know, let's build up a stash over your lifetime in case this happens again, you know, and, and, you know, I'm Jewish. So like I, we have the stories of the Holocaust where, uh, you know, like gold was stripped from, from people, like their teeth were taking out. I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous stuff. Yeah. And if you grow up with stories like that and you hear like, here's something that could possibly prevent that. Here's a way to, you know, store your wealth in a way that's unseizable. 
that's the generation that ends up seeing it as normal. That's the generation that buys the Bitcoin. That's the generation that starts adopting it. So in my opinion, that's going to happen. And that's, you know, we're looking at 20, 25 years for that to really occur. Uh, for that generation to sort of, you know, become of age and, and start building up their Bitcoin stash. Uh, so that's kind of my timeline. I think it's, it's a generation thing. Uh, could it happen faster? Maybe, but you know, technology moves in mysterious ways. It could be a lot of interesting user experience innovations, a lot of interesting onboarding innovations. So who knows? Could happen sooner. Yeah. And, you know, while you're saying, I mean, could it happen faster? I mean, what do you make of this? I mean, you posted it yourself, this, this, uh, I reposted it too uh, today. Um, I mean, after this whole mainstream lining, I mean, it's, <laughs> now it's beyond even mainstream. Now, you know, the federal uh, chairman Powell first, uh, you know, t talking about it, uh, you know, Bitcoin. Yeah, it is, a, you know, even though a speculative uh uh, store of value than you know whatever you know controversy controversy you know Trump then said about I'm not a fan of Bitcoin and now today this congressman Patrick Manhenry whatever his, his name is I think there's no capacity to kill Bitcoin is like you know trying to explain to this uh, you know very uh, irritating journalist who is <laughs> yeah. interrupting me so irritating yeah. it's like so it's extremely irritating <laughs> and. Um, that's yeah. That's your tweet here. Even uh, the quote. Even the Chinese with the firewall and the extreme intervention, the society could not kill Bitcoin. I mean, I th I think I don't want to you know again sound like Trump, but this is huge. <laughs> what, what do you make out of big this? League, I mean, is, isn't that like the trigger for mass awareness, mass adoption at at least for the beginning? I mean, I agree with mass. I don't think awareness and adoption are the same thing. That's that's one thing. So. I think, yes, uh, it's very good that this is happening. I think they're causing, you know, this is famously known as a Streisand effect, right? Where you, by, by tweeting something or saying something negative about something or trying to hide something, like all of a sudden it's in the spotlight. So Trump comes out and tweets to 60 million people, like Bitcoin sucks. It doesn't matter what he said. He just said the word Bitcoin to 60 million people. And I, I'm guarantee you a lot of them have never heard of Bitcoin or haven't really given it any thought. <laughs> and now all of a sudden the president has, has said something about it. So everybody has to have an opinion. And that starts with, you know, the government. And you can see everybody's being interviewed, all these senators, all these congressmen. What, what do you think? What do you think? Do you agree with Trump? Do you not agree with him? Do you agree with the Fed chair? Is it a store of value? What is it? This is very good. This is a very different conversation than we were having a few years ago where it's like, well, I haven't heard of Bitcoin or uh, Bitcoin's for criminals or Bitcoin is, you know, eating the energy of the planet. Now it's like Bitcoin is being considered as some kind of competitor to other currencies what does that mean? That's like, a different narrative. Starting, That's a different, different narrative, narrative. Jan, huh? I mean, yeah. also the hearing yesterday, I think today is going on with Marcus, whatever his name is, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Calibra CEO are trying yep. to, you know, uh, tell all these bunch of politicians and senators who have no notion. I don't know, either they're ignorant mm -hmm. or have like, are they asking like totally stupid questions uh, about, you know, privacy, anti and, and all this national security, you know, it's like total distraction from the, what, what, what's, you know, what is at stake actually? So what do you make out of this whole discussion? I, I think I, I love that, that they're having these hearings because it's literally bringing all these questions to the forefront, right? Because uh, Bitcoin wasn't a threat. Okay. Bitcoin was this thing. It was a bunch of nerds. It was like a silly thing. It was a Ponzi scheme. It was a bunch of people gambling right like nobody cared about bitcoin all of a sudden facebook just validated the concept of cryptocurrency they come out and say okay we want to build this world currency now everybody's asking questions like what what does it mean to build a currency uh can can companies can private entities build their own currencies can multinational companies become banks uh can they become central banks and they replace the banking system like how does this all work right these are totally different questions, which is really, really good. I think it's, you know, a lot of my, um, my people I interact with too, like uh, even uh, my parents and stuff like that, they're, they heard about this Facebook thing and they're like, well, what does that mean? So I think it becomes a different conversation. That's a good thing. I think it makes everybody question the nature of money. I think that's a, a very good thing because honestly, before I came to Bitcoin, like I, I didn't really question the nature of money. Uh, I, I knew that the dollar was not backed by gold. Um, a lot of people don't, right? A lot of people still think that there's some kind of like yeah. gold reserve, which I mean, there is the, the central banks do own gold. They have gold in their balance sheets, but the fiat currency isn't like quote unquote backed by it, right? Mm -hmm. But then you ask the question, well, why do they have gold? 
okay, there's their hedging, you know, this is a, some kind of store of value thing. And then there's all these questions that pop up. So I like that Facebook is out in front of the entire nation uh, having to answer these questions. Um, with regard to the like Congress people having a clue, it's, it's always going to be a challenge. I mean, I don't fault them for this. It's, first of all, some of them are, are quite old. But frankly, it's very difficult to understand these ideas. Even at my age, I think it's, it's challenging. Like it's, it's challenging to explain to people in their 30s and 40s of what Bitcoin is, how it works, let alone somebody who's older. Um, and then they're asking questions from their, they have a specific point of view that's, that's quite uh, entrenched in the current system, right? So their, their primary concern is like, well, how does this affect us in our current system? Does it threaten our system and so on and so forth? Whereas I think like with, for Bitcoiners, we're not really thinking about that system. We're like, we're over here doing our own thing and like, you guys can do your own thing. We don't care. I mean, honestly, it doesn't matter what Facebook does, right? Yeah. Even if Libra succeeds and brings down a billion people, great, uh, fine, I don't care. We have this other alternative system. It has these certain characteristics. It's censorship resistant. It's not inflatable. And it's a free market system. You, you decide what you want. You want the one that the government will you know, prevent you from spending or you want the one that's, that's free and open and, and anybody can use. And people will eventually come to that conclusion themselves. It just requires, like I said, it's a generational shift. It requires a lot more education. And that's why, why I'm in this space. Yeah. And there have been uh, quite a number of, you know, uh, statements and opinions also by, you know, uh, uh, people who are in the Bitcoin community or in the, le you know, pushing le legislation in Wyoming, you know, Caitlin Long, for mm -hmm. example, who yep. was saying that, I mean, I agree with her. I mean, this could be like, uh, I would just call it, you know, the red pill for the, you know, for most people, maybe, you know, eventually they yeah. will ask themselves, what is this Libra? Well, what kind of value has it? And why is Bitcoin, you know, gaining more and more in strength and value and purchasing, <coughs> you know, and yeah. um, w what's the features? What's the unique features of Bitcoin that, that other so-called whatever you know i mean it's totally false calling cryptocurrency has nothing to do with you know <laughs> decentralization openness censorship resistance all these things that andreas antonopoulos you know sings like a mantra <laughs> you know yeah so uh yeah who knows yeah actually so you mentioned caitlin long i really loved this one article she wrote recently which is about uh, systemic stability versus uh like price of volatility and she was basically saying like uh, the U.S. dollar is price stable, at least you know it's short-term price stable. But we exchange that stability, that that central bank manipulation of the currency, we exchange that for systemic instability. So once once in a while we get you know 2008. Uh, once in a while we get the dot-com crash because people have been manipulating the markets and they're not allowing crashes to properly play out and so on. Um, so we're exchanging this one kind of stability, which is everyday stability, for uh, for the systemic instability. Whereas with Bitcoin we have extreme systemic stability like we know exactly there's going to be 21 million bitcoins we know exactly the supply schedule nothing can be changed about that but in exchange we have volatility because uh the supply of bitcoin does not react to the demand so more people want it price goes up less people want it price goes down so we have extreme fluctuations in the in the price of bitcoin because of that but we have no systemic issues because the whole system is designed to be completely stable uh, and not have any fluctuations in supply and that kind of thing. You know what I like about your uh, book cover also? You go right to the point, uh, and I love that. The technology is called, uh, Inventing Bitcoin is your title, and then your subtitle is the technology behind the first truly scarce, I mean, you could call it scarcest, but a <laughs> decentralized money explained. Like, you know, if, if that, that one principle, that one essence people would get, I think we would have a much easier time. I mean, we never yeah. had in our whole, you know, human evolution, human history, never had a truly scarce or scarcest, hardest money ever created in human history, right? Un Agreed, yeah. I, I think that's definitely, yeah, it's, for me, Bitcoin, um, explaining Bitcoin comes from two angles. One of them, and, and I don't know if I should rethink the subtitle. I like the subtitle. Uh, talking about scarcity, I think that's really important um, because, but, you know, at the same time, a lot of people don't understand why scarcity is, is important, right? So a lot of people don't understand why gold became a money and not, uh, you know, copper uh, or, you know, tree leaves. Why, why aren't we trading tree leaves as money, right? Like a lot of people require some thought to get there. So I think that's one aspect of Bitcoin that's really important is the scarcity. The other is the censorship resistance. And I, 
I almost nowadays start with the censorship resistance. I, I, I talk a lot of times about like, look at what's happening with China. You have everybody making digital payments. We're going to a system where everybody in the world is making digital payments and you're basically going to have to choose. Are you going to want a system where all digital payments are flowing through the government, where everything is surveilled, where everything is a permission system? Can I or can I not buy cigarettes online? Can I or can I not uh, look at pornography? Uh, can I you know, buy Bitcoin with my, the money in my Wells Fargo account? Right. This is something I tweeted about recently because people were talking about that. We have censorship. We have we have a lot of censorship. It's just for stuff that people that's on the fringes. Okay, like maybe most people don't care about buying cannabis uh, with their credit card. But the thing is, it's going legal in like half the states in the union at this point. Um, we're in Illinois, and, and uh, next year we're going to legalize marijuana. Now we we're going to legalize marijuana. We have all these shops all, all over town, and they can't accept credit cards. That's a black market. That's wow. bad. That's people carrying around wads of cash, putting themselves at risk because the government says you can't. Uh, you know, visa, you can't take um, and payments for, for drugs because, you know, we decided this is illegal. So that's a big problem. So I think that there's two issues there, the scarcity and the sound money aspect, and then also the censorship resistance aspect, the aspect that allows you to have money that is truly spendable anywhere that you can take with you. Uh, if your country is, is uh, collapsing, you can escape, you can take that money with you. Um, I think that's a really big big part of it as well yeah um let me see i was going to ask yeah um let me let me ask you do you think that the everything that's happening right now you know geopolitically you know the the, the trade wars the 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 currency wars actually is going on but not really mm -hmm. talked about it's sort of a like you know it's not really a lot of things that happening or, or talked about at least in the mainstream is like a distraction for what is really going on do you think that the, all these factors parameters and conditions are compounding to accelerate this process you know um, getting into ma you know more and more into consciousness awareness understanding and and eventually you know for, maybe for the first time like uh, getting in touch you know? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely something to that. And I, I think it is starting to affect the mainstream. I mean, you have Donald Trump tweeting, uh, I don't remember what he said, something to the effect of like, we need to basically devalue the dollar so that our trade is stronger. <laughs> like he literally said that. I mean, he said it in a way that most people didn't understand what that meant, but that's what he said, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to find that tweet. I, I don't know where it is, but he basically said something to the effect of like, we need to make our dollar, you know, uh, he didn't say it's not about making the dollar weaker per se. He says something to the effect of the Fed needs to like fix our dollar so that, you know, <laughs> we have more, we stimulate more trade or something like that. But he was basically talking about devaluing the dollar. He's like, the Ch Chinese are doing it. We need to do it. Otherwise we're not remaining competitive in the, in the global uh, trade system. And it's like, Hey, you, you just told 60 million people that you want their money to be worth less. <laughs> uh, Maybe a lot of them didn't understand what you were saying. I mean, you look at the, the, the tweets and like there's all this Trump supporters like, yeah, yeah, you know, rah, 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 America. But he's literally saying he's going to punish the American people so that we can like sort of stimulate the, Ameri the economy. But it's ultimately the people at the bottom that suffer, the people who, who aren't yeah. like living paycheck to paycheck and the goods and everything around them is inflating. Mm -hmm. And they're, the cost of education and healthcare and everything else is going through the roof. And yeah, we can get stuff from China cheap and we have cheap TVs, but the real stuff that people need to live, the housing, the healthcare, the education, like that stuff is inflating like crazy. And uh, people aren't talking about it. I think we're going to start hearing more and more about it though. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, I've been thinking about this, um, you know, for me, the, the president, you know, the role of the president, it's just another, you know, figure, a role, you know, that he's playing. Uh, it's a puppet for me, you know, but don't you think, it's, I don't want to go into policy or speculation or whatever, but I mean, Whatever one thinks about Trump, do you think he's um, he's sort of playing along this game and and just you know pretending to be I don't know you know saying things but then pretending to be something else but having a position on Bitcoin <laughs> it's like uh, really something yeah. like why is he you know is he doing this on purpose he's you know? buying the dip he's buying the dip <laughs> I don't I don't know uh, I honestly don't know I don't know how to judge him I mean I'm I'm not uh, I, I find him to be not a very pleasant 
human being. No, me neither, <laughs> but useful. I mean, everything he's doing is actually useful. Yes, everything he's doing is actually teaching people about why Bitcoin is important. <laughs> exactly. The thing is, like, I don't think there's any, I, I, don't, I think both the Republicans and the Democrats are at this point going around, along the same route. Uh, there's a few people who get it, and there's a few people who are like, to think that Bitcoin is a good idea, and like that, that uh, representative we just mentioned coming out and saying, like, Bitcoin's unstoppable. There, you know he's a hodler. I mean, there's people who, who have clearly been influenced at this point that are in our government, which is great. But I think the overall theme is like you have the sort of mainstream political view, which is that there is this uh, zero sum game being played across the world. And like, you know, the Chinese are devaluing the currency, so we have to devalue our currency. They're doing tariffs, so we have to do tariffs. And, you know, again, I'm not an economist. I don't want to get too deep into stuff like this where, where I, I'm going to speak out of. Uh, my knowledge base, but just from a standpoint of, is this how we want the world to work? It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel that fighting these currency wars at the expense of uh, the people in those countries is a good idea. We need to give people an alternative that's not political, that's, that's a free market alternative that they can okay. choose. And so I, I, when, I, when people say like, is Bitcoin going to become a world currency? I don't know, um, but I would be very happy if it became even a fraction of what gold it is, where people could have like a little stash of Bitcoin in case the country goes crazy. And that stash in and of itself becomes a check on the, uh, on the uh, behavior of that country, right? Um, this is something I've talked about before, but I think that uh, America is a really, it has a very interesting um, system of government because, of, because it's basically decentralized, right? We have the executive, the, uh, the judicial, and the, um, the legislative branches, mm -hmm. and they check each other, okay? Now, the one thing that they don't check is their spending because effectively they still have a very strong, even though theoretically the central bank is, is independent, it's very theoretical because you see Trump's tweeting at, at Jay Powell like every day, like, <laughs> lower the rates, man, lower the rates. You know, like there's only so much of that you can claim as independence. So I think we've survived this country regardless of who the president is, regardless of who is sitting on those, um, in those seats because we have a pretty decent amount of decentralization of the government. And I think Bitcoin is the fourth pillar of decentralization that will make, if, if we do it right, will make us the strongest country on the planet because yeah. now we will be checking the government's ability to spend money on wars and all kinds of crazy stuff exactly. because yeah. we have this little stash on the side and we say, look, you guys start abusing the currency. We're all going into this stash. Yeah. And so we have that ability. And I think that's, yeah. if we do that, that would be extremely American and extremely libertarian and, and very much aligned with you know what what the founding fathers would have wanted for our country yeah and didn't um what's his name uh talib um talib what's his name uh, the who wrote uh the, nasim talib, nasim yeah. talib who said like <coughs> bitcoin is like the the one and only or last or something like that i'm not sure how to paraphrase it like insurance policy against the orwellian mm -hmm. state um so um and I, one more thing I wanted to say, I mean, there are some, uh, when, you know, when Brady Sherman came out, <laughs> yeah. he's uh, ran, it's like, we need a law, you know, to nip this in the butt, you know? <laughs> like, like, yeah, no, it was like, funny how he, he basically right? was saying, like, we need to stop the owner. He almost said ownership, but then he was like, uh, I mean, purchasing of, right? Because, like, yeah. banning ownership of something is like, this is an entirely different kind of thing. It's like super totalitarian. It's like, you can't have this stuff. Uh, you can't m use your computer for mining. Like you can't, I, I'm going to tell you what you can, can or cannot do inside the privacy of your own home. Like, oh my God, you're going to go down that route in America. You're going to have some backlash, dude. <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, yeah, um, let me, let's, just, let's wrap this up. Uh, we have a, uh, I, I want to have, you know, uh, keep it short and sweet. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to like communicate to our listeners and viewers what you think is really essential, really important? I'm going to, you know, put up all your links, your book uh, on the show notes, but is there anything like which is at this, in this phase, like really important to look at, to listen to or whatever, or to read? Uh, well, you should read all the, th you should definitely read uh, the Safe Medina Moose uh, Bitcoin Standard book. Yeah. You should definitely listen to Stefan Levera and Marty Bent and all that kind of stuff. We can plug all that all day. But, you know, what I want to say actually is um, I think there's a large degree of impatience. And, and one, you know, a lot of people, especially on, uh, on the Bitcoin critic side, 
uh, will say something like, you know, one uh, percent of Bitcoin payments are being used by merchants. Like it has no adoption, yeah. or yeah. you know, uh, the one percent or two percent of the world has Bitcoin. Like nobody wants this. There's a large degree of impatience. Okay, when I I'm a technologist, right? So I when I looked at Bitcoin, I first saw technology before I saw money, and if you look at it as technology, you will want a technological type of an adoption cycle. You will want, you know, Facebook was able to take out MySpace within the span of uh, like one or two years, okay? Uh, because it was a superior technology, but not just that, it was a superior implementation of a social, uh, of a social graph. It was a better way for people to, to communicate. But Bitcoin isn't that, it's not a technology, it's money. And it's a completely different way of thinking about money. And yeah. that is something that's not gonna happen in 10 years. So when people are, are saying, well, Bitcoin has already failed because it hasn't achieved some arbitrary metric of adoption that they have for it that they think, you know, based on other things uh, should, should be happening. Uh, my challenge is to, you know, lower your time preference. This is something I really yeah. um, learned from reading uh, Safe's book is that, and also just, you know, being in, inside of the Bitcoin space is when you... When you have Bitcoin, when you have a sort of deflationary money, you, you think of things a little bit differently. You think about the long term. You maybe don't buy the frivolous uh, crap that you might have bought. You maybe hold on to your money. You save. And it's the same with exp the way we're going to see Bitcoin adoption. Like we need a cultural shift towards that kind of money. And that's going to take time. It's going to take a long time for people to get over a lot of the hangups they have. So I would say don't be discouraged. A lot of people, both Bitcoiners and, and non-coiners you know, anti -coiners or no-coiners or whatever you want to call them, um, come at it from, from that same angle where a lot of people are expecting hyper-Bitcoinization tomorrow. And if it happens, yeah. okay, great. Um, but I'm settling in for the long run. I'm looking at this as a 25 to 50 year adoption cycle. Oh, really? I'm okay. looking at people, you know, I'm looking for that culture shift. I'm looking for people thinking and demanding Bitcoin as payment, which is, you know, right now we're really, you might say we're in the collectible stage. People are speculating that Bitcoin might become that. It might become that which other people want. But until we have 10, 25, 30, 50% of the world holding Bitcoin, we can't really talk about it as, uh, you know, as, as adoption. It's, right now it is speculative. That's okay. Yeah. It's because speculation drives everything else. Exactly. But it's a speculative store of value phase. Would you agree? Yes. It's, yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I mean, it, and again, this is where a lot of people have a hang up because when they say, you say store of value and they say, yeah, but it went down by 90%. Well, <laughs> yes, it did because we're in the middle of like crazy adoption hype cycles and we're going to continue to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it doesn't change the nature of, of the system. Nature is that it's a scarce system. And as long as we do believe that other people will continue to adapt it and it will become a dominant uh, form of money in the world, then it's a great store of value. Um, it's a it's a great non-inflationary asset that's for sure, uh, but you have to look at it in a very long time scale. Like it's not a great sort of value if you you know need to pay for something tomorrow and you're worried about it going down eighty percent. Then you shouldn't be doing it. You should only put into Bitcoin uh, the amount of money that you're willing to wait on and and, and sit on for a while uh, and maybe years, maybe decades. Um, that's that's how I look at it. Yeah. You, you just uh, said impatience. I mean, I, I, I admit I, I'm, I'm a little bit impatient <clears throat> because I've got this vision, you know, that at least a critical mass of, of humanity by whatever year, 2024, 2030, has at least, you know, a, a smallest fraction of a Bitcoin. I mean, that's my just one dream that I have. Like, yeah. But, you know, it's easier, you know, done than said because... Um, I mean, when we talk about, you know, the poorest people in India, wherever, I just had a, you know, with a, with an Indian guy, a, a wonderful interview also recently. I'm like, you know, even $10 or 10 euros is a lot of money, you know, yep. for these people. I mean, even if they wanted yeah, to get like sure. 0 0.002 or whatever of Bitcoin, that's a lot of money for them. But yeah, you know, I, that's why I th I'm actually really excited about the uh, various implementations of earning Bitcoin rather than buying Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, if you, if you perform a service, we're, we're entering into this global economy, right? Like an Indian person or a person in Venezuela can perform some kind of online service for somebody in America and earn $5 worth of Bitcoin over lightning, let's say, right? That eliminates a lot of that friction. So I think we're in a phase where we need to build a lot more services and uh, you know, applications and stuff like that where people can actually earn Bitcoin. Um, I really love Lolly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug Lolly yeah, here because yeah. uh -huh. you know, it's more for Americans because it's like a, it's a cash back on shopping or whatever, but but the idea of you didn't have to do anything, you just earned some Bitcoin on the side, 
um, is a powerful way of getting Bitcoin in people's hands because I don't think we can ex expect people in impoverished economies to go out and buy Bitcoin, to pay on chain fees, to like set up wallets or nodes. Like this is stuff that is so secondary to like survival. We can't expect that to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, if we can empower them, however, to earn Bitcoin, um, there's an organization that, that uh, I forget the name of, but there's some organization that was helping Afghan women uh, earn coins by, by do, like learning to code and then doing, oh, uh, okay. and earning Bitcoin, which is really cool because in Afghanistan, uh, it's apparently very difficult to open a bank account if you're a woman, yeah. unless you have the man's permission. And so, the billions of people like that, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who uh, don't even know. Yeah, exactly. No bank account, no way to earn money, you know, completely um, uh, totalitarian societies. That's where I think there's a huge uh, opportunity. And this is where I, I'm really interested in helping um, in some capacity to help people earn Bitcoin. And that's the way that they get into it. And that's the way. And, and they already have it on Lightning Network. It's already, you know, in a layer that they can spend quickly and, and painlessly and without, uh, without fees. But the thing is that again, we're still really far from that. And it's going to take a long time for those companies to emerge and for successful business models to be developed um, and all of that stuff. So uh, I'm optimistic, but I'm also just cautious, cautioning against being over, uh, overzealous in the, in the short term for this to happen tomorrow because I, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. This is a big movement. This is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. This is a once-in-a-millennia thing where we have a new form of money and we need a giant cultural shift for people to actually want that money. Wow, beautiful said. Thank you so much, uh, Jan Prisker, author of the book Inventing Bitcoin. I uh, hope we can repeat this. Uh, uh, I would love to invite you also maybe on a panel discussion with one or another Bitcoiner who might you, you might know, you know. Uh, and yeah, let's repeat that in the, in the future. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, Jan. Okay, thank you, Kevin. It, it was really awesome. Thank you so much. We yeah, it was, it was great. And I, I love your podcast also. I've been, I've been uh, following up on all the episodes that have come out recently. <laughs> Some of my favorite people, uh, Connor Brown and uh, Eric Bosco was really great. So thank you for that. Keep, keep it up. Yeah, let's work together. Okay, Jan. Thank you All so right. much. Bye-bye.